All right, so we're continuing our track through Romans. We're in Romans 8. I think this is the 17th message out of the book of Romans. And this particular passage deals with the groaning, creation's groaning, and kind of ends with our own groaning and and our future hope that we have in Christ Jesus. One of the things that comes up as we kind of try to wrap our minds around this picture or this truth of groaning is that in creation, since the fall, nothing has been quite as it should be on the earth. That uh, the earth was cursed uh, in the fall with Adam and Eve, and ever since uh, the earth has been subject to what, what Paul's going to say, decay, or to futility ever since that time. And the redemption that comes in Christ Jesus is not just for people, but for the earth as well. Um, when, we, when we take this and he starts talking about our own groaning and our personal groaning, uh, the way that works out so, so often in our lives is that even when we're having very sweet times of fellowship or you're having incredible times of family unity and there's just peace and it appears as though immediately around us everything is just as it should be. There's always with us this nagging reality that it's just not. That this time is going to pass. That very soon this, this peace that we have and this unity that we have is, is going to go back and we're going to have to go through the rest of our lives, deal with everything that happens with the fall, living in uh, an under corrupt government, in a world uh, where a nature itself is not right. Um, I think about, I check on the volcano situation in Hawaii, and I think this was on Thursday, between Wednesday night and Thursday, they recorded some 500 earthquakes in a 24-hour period. And still just, that's very active. And, and to me, that is an image of the earth's groaning and all of the energy that is produced from the earth's groaning, it just had to come out in this area in Hawaii. And, and incredible devastation, incredible power at work coming up out of the earth. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible thing that's happening. So we're going to look into these texts and, and see uh, what Paul tells the Romans and what we can ultimately learn from, learn from him. So this is uh, Romans chapter 8, and we're going to start in verse 18. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And so this first uh, verse, 18, it seems to be sort of the introduction to the rest of this passage. Uh, Because as we are pilgrims or sojourners on the earth, we're living on this world where nature is groaning, and uh, we ourselves are grown inwardly, and we have this sort of reality that things just aren't the way they should be. And Paul begins, and he, he shapes the way he's going to approach thinking of it this way. And he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so uh, for Paul... When he says that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed to us, there's another passage in 2 Corinthians 11 where we get a a window into the kinds of things that Paul suffered where he said it's the, the sufferings of this time, they're not worth comparing to what's going to come when uh, Jesus returns and we're with him 
uh, whether it's in heaven or he returns to earth. And uh, he's talking in this passage, he's sort of comparing himself to the other apostles. And basically he's saying he, he's worked harder than all the other apostles. He suffered more. This is, this is how he uh, communicated this to the Corinthians. He says, I know I sound like a madman. But I have served him, this is Jesus Christ, I have served Jesus Christ far more than any of the other apostles. He says, I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then, besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my feeling that weakness? Who is led astray and I do not burn with anger? Paul, when he says, I do not consider the sufferings of this present time worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us, he suffered greatly. Now, more so than any of the other apostles. And he says, you could take all the things I've suffered and you could place them and, uh, on one side of a sheet of paper And on the other side, you can place this future glory when Jesus rules and reigns. And we live under his uh, lordship. And he governs the earth as it should be. He's saying, these things aren't even worth comparing. Right? Uh, Paul echoes Jesus in many ways around suffering. Uh, This week, we had David Novogratz's birthday. And we have a group of guys that prays on Thursday mornings. And... I really wanted to bless David. I I felt like uh, Wednesday night we acknowledged David and Elizabeth had this kind of funny poem she wrote about him. But there's this, there's this side of being a child of God where uh, we just have to be very serious and sober minded that what the world calls blessing, God does not. Mm -hmm. And we, we read a couple passages We read Psalm 1, but we also read Matthew 5. And Jesus, in the early part of Matthew 5, gives us the Beatitudes. And it starts with, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And it goes on and on, verse after verse, and kind of culminates with Jesus saying, blessed are you when you are persecuted, when people revile you. For my name's sake. And it's a we don't tend to think about the blessing of suffering for the name of Christ. Uh, but, but both Jesus and uh, Paul in the scriptures give us this image of suffering as a part of this life and truly what it means to be blessed. And, and so uh, Paul is letting the Romans know. And he, he in another passage he says when he's talking about the weight of God's glory and the glory that's awaiting us. He's saying, you you can't even compare these things, uh, the glory that is going to come. And so part of what we're going to be doing at the end of this talk today, at the end of this teaching, is how do we become a people who rise above the myriad of different things that are constantly calling at us on the video screen, through commercials, Uh, from our friends, from our families, from our neighbors. I mean, literally, at the gas pump, they now have screens. 
that are telling you the way you should think, what you should think about, what you should focus on, right? It's constant. But we're called to be a people who are like Paul, who follow Jesus, that rise above the culture, that rise above all the voices, all the images, and we have this seared into our minds, this future glory. When Jesus Christ returns and he rules and reigns, and it changes the way we live. It changes the things we devote our lives to. It changes the things that we uh, give our time and our money to. And Paul uh, basically is letting him know, hey, you, you pick up the mantle of following Jesus, you're going to suffer. But you need to understand right now that no matter what you suffer in this life for Jesus Christ, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the kingdom of Jesus Christ, that suffering does not compare to the glory that will come. Amen. Okay? And we need to be a people who live and breathe that. We need to be a people who shepherd our children into that, uh, our grandchildren. Um, that's going to be a big part of our takeaway today, understanding that and, and pressing into that. And so then Paul goes through and he talks about creation in, in unique language, right? We don't think about the earth as, as doing these things. He, he kind of makes uh, what we consider unanimate in the earth very animate. He says the creation it waits with eager longing. The creation was subjected to futility. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's longing to be set free from its bondage to corruption. This is... Uh, the word for corruption here is uh, like a few, uh, decay. That this image that the earth, God did not create the earth to uh, undergo decay, but for the earth to be continually uh, full of, uh, of life and producing life. And, and so things are just not the way they should be, even for the earth. And, it, and at this time when uh, it will receive this, Freedom from this corruption and this futility uh, when the glory of the children of God is revealed. Once, once uh, things are actually seen as being the way they should be and that creation uh, has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth. Uh, it's, a, it's an incredible picture. And so what I want us to do is kind of have this image of understanding what Paul is talking about. Uh, there's language that scholars will use sometimes, and they call it a meta-narrative. And a meta-narrative just simply means that there is one story, and it's God's story, and it's over all of creation. And every other story is subject to God's story, because we know His will and His plan and His purposes will come to pass. But as we relate to ourselves and as we relate to the earth, we are kind of in this time between times, where in the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth, and in the fall, the earth itself was cursed. And, and then you have this future time when there is no longer any curse. Uh, that curse that was uh, cast on or proclaimed over the earth in Genesis, uh, God kind of undoes or or stops that curse, but we live in, and we kind of hang in this balance between this time of the cursing and the end of the curse. Mm -hmm. We live in this time when the earth and the governments and the things of the earth are not the way they should be. And it's, it, it gives us perspective. Uh, it sets sort of uh, the right expectations for our lives, uh, for why things are the way they are. So uh, here's the first passage from Genesis 3. Uh, this is, uh, uh, God has already kind of pronounced judgment on the serpent, and I believe he has addressed Eve already, and now he's addressing Adam. And he says, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground because of you. Right? So, the creation. God gave Adam and Eve stewardship of the earth. Rule and reign over it. Populate the earth. Fill the earth. And because they disobeyed God, God said, that which was under your control is now cursed. Right? Cursed is the ground because of you. 
in pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the, of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And so when we think about the earth that we live on, some, so many times we have these wrong expectations of our lives. And understand God, because of the fall, has cursed the ground that uh, our lives are going to be hard. Okay, On the face of the earth, the earth your life is going to be hard. And so many uh, young people and so many uh, I see people confused about, they think it should be different. And they're disillusioned about life. They're, they think it's supposed to be easy. That the path is supposed to be wide and easy and flat. But that's not true. It's going to be hard. Following Jesus, is, uh, uh, Jesus talks about a narrow gate and a very hard path of following after him. And we just understand that that's the way it is. And um, it goes all the way back to the fall and the curse is, is the earth. And then we have this incredible passages from the end of the Bible. Genesis being the first book of the Bible. Revelations being the final book of the Bible. And uh, John, when he writes in Revelations, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, uh, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned, adorned for her husband. And then in chapter 22, verse 3, says, No longer will there be a curse upon anything. Okay? For the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him. And so for us, as we're kind of considering having a, a biblical worldview, a biblical view of how we interpret things on the earth, calamities, uh, natural disasters, even when we think about uh, governing bodies and politics and, and um, all these different kinds of things, we need to understand we are, we, we are living between the time the earth was cursed and the time that the curse will be no more. And we should have the right kind of perspective. Um, that deals specifically with creation in the, in the earth. And then, and then Paul talks about ourselves and personally the groaning that we have. In verse 23 he says, not only the creation is groaning and subject to futility and decay. He says, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so he's saying, just like the creation was subject to those things, uh, the futility, the decay, things are not the way they should be um, with creation. It says things are not the way they should be with us. Even those of us who are saved, right? We still have, if you take seriously the call to follow Jesus, to love other people, to do everything in your power to draw people close to Jesus, you're going to find out that you're in big trouble. Because you yourself are not right. You desire things that bring death to you. You pursue things that draw you away from God. And if, if you're not on guard, you actually begin to despise the very people you're supposed to love. Um, you, you're jealous 
over somebody else being blessed. Uh, you do the math. It's just as soon as something good happens in someone's life, you start to do the math of, well, I don't know why they get that blessing. I deserve that kind of a blessing. I mean, I get my tithes, and I go to church, and we start doing these things, and it's like, there is something seriously wrong with me. And so in those moments, we know the Spirit of God is, is, is with us, and we grow like, Lord God, I just want to do the good that you called me to do. And yet there is this other thing at work within me that's drawing me away from you, that it is not life to me, it is not life to the people around me. And not only is the world not right, but neither am I. We groan inwardly. And this inevitably takes us to this place where we need the, the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, I love how Paul ends this with prayer. Before we get there, I want to look at a couple quick passages. Again, one, uh, they're both from uh, the Apostle John. Uh, but in 1 John 3, he says, Dear friends, uh, we are uh, already God's children. But he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. And so this hope that we have of this incredible future when Jesus Christ comes to rule and reign over the earth, this incredible hope that we have, he attaches to a manner of living. And he says, uh, if you have this right hope, you'll be purified by it. You will uh, try to run from sin and what is evil, and you will uh, seek to be pure. So in those moments when I'm groaning inwardly, I don't just accept that I am sinful apart from God. I want to be pure. I pray to be forgiven and cleansed of those things. God, I do not want to be a person that, that, does, that, that does the math when you bless somebody else and thinks about the blessings that I have as not measuring up to the blessings. that I don't want to be that kind of person. God, when you bless somebody, I want to rejoice with them. And so I don't just accept the shortcomings that I have in my life but because I have this incredible hope of one day seeing and being with Jesus and, and actually becoming who I was created to be, I reject the sin that I have. I repent of it. I ask to be cleansed of it. I ask for my mind to be transformed and renewed. And I think that we're confused. We live in a culture where we accept everybody, no questions asked, all behavior. It's like, that's not Christianity. We... We, we know the outside world is going to be full of sin. God's already judged them. But when it comes to people in the body of Christ, it's not anything else. We are called to be like Christ Jesus. We are called to purify ourselves. Okay? And so when we see these things in our speech, in our behaviors, in our thoughts, right? We reject them and we turn away from them. Uh, we ask to be cleansed and redeemed and made new. And then in Revelations 21, this is again the end of, of, of the matter uh, of the, the, the writings of Scripture. Paul said, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And so while we live in this time between the curse and the end of the curse, while we live in this time where our eyes do not get to uh, the track on the eyes of God or the face of God, we are given this revelation, and, and we have this incredible hope. Uh, we know we know that we're in this place, but we can see uh, what is unseen because of what God has told us. All the effects uh, uh, of the fall on creation. All the effects of the fall on me personally. God says, at this time, 
um, all these former things will be gone forever. Okay? There will be a time when it's over, when this age ends. And we're called to live here and now in light of that day. Okay? This is going to happen. God's Amen. 100%. Mm-hmm. Okay? You can choose not to focus on this or think about this, but um, it will happen. And, and my hope is that if you and I will choose to uh, submit ourselves to God and His Spirit, submit ourselves to God and His plan for our lives, we will look at, at this time with eager expectation. We'll begin to live for that day here and now. You need to know that you'll suffer. It's going to be part of following Jesus here and now. But the suffering you have now won't be won't is not worth comparing to what's going to be uh, revealed to us at that time. Like, it not it doesn't even belong on the same scale. It doesn't doesn't belong on the, the right hand column of the comparison chart. It will be absolutely incredible. So, um, what do I have? Oh, just went back to that passage and then. Uh, the, the theme that I wanted to just emphasize in the rest of this passage is that if we take everything Paul has said up to this point to heart, we own uh, what he has revealed to us, what God has revealed to us from the beginning of Romans up to this point in Romans chapter 8 about ourselves, about our calling, about having descended from Adam, all these things, the creation itself groans. We groan inwardly. Uh, our call to pray and be in the throne room of God. One of the things that's going to happen is uh, you're not going to feel right. You're going to know you need lots of help. And God says um, that he has given us a helper. He says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought to. So the Spirit helping us in our weakness, because we don't know what to pray for, we need to directly connect that to the Spirit interceding for us on the will of God. The things we don't know what to pray for, the areas where we are weak, is knowing and doing the will of God. And so the picture that is painted for us here, the truth that is revealed, is that every time you enter the throne room of God, whether you're with a group of people or you're doing it personally, uh, the Holy Spirit is with you. And no matter what you're praying, you may not know how to pray as you should. The Holy Spirit is there like the translator. He's taking uh, what should you should be praying, what your right prayer is, what your heart's true desire should be, and he's translating it into the will of God. And he's saying, God, give us your will for this brother. Give us your will for this sister. Even if we're ignorant, to what the will of God is, we can go before God knowing we can't pray wrong prayers. Right? The Holy Spirit is there to intercede for us. And and this helps me so much because when uh, it is most uh, acute in my life how messed up I am and how messed up the world is and how messed up Bernie is. (laughs) it's true. It's true. <laughs> okay. Welcome to the club. It's at that time. It's at that time when I most feel ashamed and like I shouldn't be in the throne room of God. Mm-hmm. When my sin is great. When I have chosen sin. When I have done what is wrong. I feel like I should hide, like Adam and Eve did, and cover myself. And God says, "No, I have covered you. Not only have I covered you, but I've given you my Spirit. I want you. You belong in my presence." Pray without ceasing, whether you feel like it or you should. Uh, whether you feel like it or you don't. Um, whether you've done the math on your righteousness, however you want. He's saying, I've given you my spirit. I've covered you in my son. I want you with me. You can't go wrong. Pray. Amen? Amen. All right, so uh, our takeaway. Uh, in light of these things, I have a few... and. And anybody, when we get done, if, if you have something that you would add to these, please just take a note and we'll open it up for conversation. The first thing I just say is, as we live in this time between 
the curse and the end of the curse. Our posture in this life as Christian workers between the curse and the end of the curse. So just addressing, that's not even a complete sentence, but understanding uh, this is not our home. Amen. You are not made for this life. It's not the way it is. You are not created to live on an earth that's cursed. Mm-hmm. You're not made to live under uh, governments that are evil and led by evil people. You're not made for a mind that is given over to sin in the flesh. Okay? Right now, our posture should be people who are at work. Okay? And the thing I think about when I, when I think about working is that I, I tend to, like, uh, I'm building a house right now. And I tend to think all of the spare time I have, until the house is finished, I work on the house. That's what I do. Whether I'm putting together uh, uh, bids or bills or invoices or whether I'm out pounding nails, um, until the job is done, that's what I do, right? Uh, I also think about, like, when Mike and I work together really well, when we're rubbing shoulders and we're working, it's about getting the job done. And if I step on his foot, I don't have to say, oh, man, I'm sorry I stepped on your foot. And if, he, and if he steps on my foot while we're working or we bump into each other, it's like, no, the job is greater. That's the thing we need to accomplish is this work. And, and we can both work together, get more done, and accomplish this goal. And we can deal with some of the, the edgy stuff of you know personality and all that stuff. That's subject to the work getting done. Okay? And you and I are called to be Christian workers. We're called to be witnesses for Jesus and his kingdom. We're called to be light in this dark place. We're called to be people who walk on a narrow path and call out the wide path. We're called to be people who uh, make much of Jesus and his righteousness and invite people up out of the world into this uh, story of God in Christ Jesus. We're Christian workers. Guess what? There will never be a time unless Jesus returns when the job's done. And so the posture of your life should be, I'm at work. I'm not at home. I wasn't made. This life is not made for a vacation. I think I, you can take this uh, and, and, and do something wrong with it, but your lazy boy may be the most antithetical thing to your faith. Okay? You're at work. Your posture should be as one who's at work. I loved this. We did Russ's final pastor's luncheon. And most of the guys around the table, I had asked them for, everybody gets a chance to preach at Russ and give him their blessing or whatever. And around the table over and over, and everybody was just like, uh, you're not retiring, right? You don't retire from your faith. And the next guy was like, don't just uh, you know quit your faith and that sort of thing. And I, knowing Russ, was like, of course he's not going to quit his faith. Right? It's impossible. You don't. He's a Christian worker. And his plans are to continue his faith. Right? Not in the same manner that he has for the last uh, season of his life. It will change. But he's not going to put his feet up when it comes to his faith. Right? Amen? Amen. And neither should we. Okay? Uh, A text like the one we're looking at in Romans 8 calls us out of this world and this world system. It says you are here uh, for God's work and God's purposes. You want to see the power of God at work in your life, you will have to answer the calling of God on your life. And you will see it. Amen. You will if you answer the call. Amen. Okay? But if you think that this life is about rest and relaxation, you'll miss it. Okay? And so we need to understand our place. The there's this really unique passage. It's not even really a passage, it's like one or two verses in the Old Testament about the sons of Issachar. And it said that they understood the times in which they lived, and they basically lived rightly according to the will of God in the midst of the generation that they lived in. And a text like this calls us to do that. Understand you live on a cursed earth. You are divided even against yourself uh, because of the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
understand the world in which you live in and discern the will of God among your generation and do it. Okay? It's going to be far different than the world's plan for you. But it'll also be far better. And the fruit of that is, is pure, it's clean, uh, it, 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 it uh, gives you um, a lot of peace. Uh, next thing. Uh, be people who see what is unseen and live in the sure hope of the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. And I just say, pray this into our lives. Shepherd this into the hearts of our children and grandchildren. Uh, I need people like Mike and Dave and Paolo and the people who come and pray for me. I need them to pray this over me. Uh, Brian, God, give Brian, sear it into his mind this day when he will see you face to face. Uh, God, empower him by your spirit to live in light of that day. Okay? Um, I need you guys to carry the mantle of this for me, and I need to carry it for you. Okay? Um, and, and be parents. When you're tucking your kids in at night, talk about one day our king will return. And he is going to bring a new heaven and a new earth with him. And things will not be like they are today. You know how when you walk through that field at Bethel and you've got that thorn in your foot that caused all this pain? That's not the way it should be. And one day it will never be like that. You will run through the fields on this earth and never have to worry about falling or stumbling or a thorn in your foot. Because the earth itself will be redeemed. And the government of this world will be right. And all things will be as it should. And, and tell this to your children over and over again. Sear it into their minds, right? One day, things will be the way they should. It is not as it should be now. Children in, in elementary school have to worry about somebody coming in and shooting up the school. Doing drills for uh, shooter active shooter training, right? It's not the way it should be. Um, Worrying about what's on TV and should your kids be watching it? Should you be watching it? Right? It's not the way it should be. But one day, all things will be the way they should be. Amen. And we long for that day. Mm -hmm. We live according to it. And too many grandparents training up their grandchildren in the ways of the world and not the ways of the Lord. Okay? Shepherd your grandchildren. Put a vision into your grandchildren about the coming day of the Lord. The rule and the reign of Jesus. Shepherd their hearts to this. Awaken them to this. We desperately need a generation of people who, when they look into the, the spirit of their mind, they see this coming day. When their eyes will see Jesus Christ. That day is coming. For every person in the world. You will one day open your eyes and see Jesus Christ before you. Live in such a way that you're like, yes! Not like, oh, I'm wasting it. Right? Live rightly here and now. Uh, do this work in our families. Uh, the final thing is just as we work this out daily, both in community and in solitude before God in prayer, uh, know the Holy Spirit is always there interceding on your behalf. Okay? Uh, God has given you His Spirit. The same Spirit that empowered Jesus Christ to do what He did lives in you. And He intercedes for you. And uh, rush into the presence of God. Uh, trust that what God said here is true. That no matter what you pray, the Holy Spirit is translating your prayer into uh, the will of God for you. You can't go wrong when you're praying uh, to God. Amen? Amen? All right. Comments or questions? Romans chapter 8. Cass. Cass.